So we're going to be following along Matthew chapter 21 will be our scripture reading today, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you anything, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for, a, for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others, they cut branches from the trees and they spread them along the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God. So, as we reflect on Jesus' entry on Palm Sunday and how exciting that was for all the people who had gathered, we take a moment to first go back in time. Back in time to some of the first moments where we hear about God's glory coming amongst his people when they were dwelling in their, in their cities. This was um, the people that had been rescued from Egypt. They came out to a mountain and they heard that God was going to appear to them and he was going to be with them. And so they were supposed to purify themselves. They were supposed to get ready for his coming. And then all of a sudden, the situation, the scene changed. All of a sudden, this mountain that had blue sky behind it, all of a sudden it got really cloudy. And then there was lightning and peals of thunder rumbling through. And then the ground shook. And the people were terrified. They were terrified. All the people who were gathered, all the people who heard that God was coming, now all of a sudden when God was here, they said, Moses, you go talk to God. Ah, I don't want to do that because it's too much. We might die if we go in the presence of God. And so he went up there, and that's when God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments and other commands for his people, and the people waited below. But I think it's something we can appreciate, knowing like in our area what it's like when all of a sudden darkness looms overhead. If you go back in time about four years ago, we had those fires about, I don't know, they made it up to about 10 miles south of us in Corona. And the, the, the fires were so, such smoke covered over us, it was like a zombie apocalypse. It was dark, thick darkness. You could feel. It was just unnerving to come out of the store and just, I don't know, just ominous. And then add on top of that an earthquake. And we know what earthquakes feel like around here as well. There was one just um, Friday, I think it was, about 6.15 down Lake Elsinore, about 4.5. To have those things together. And then thunder and lightning, we don't get that very often. But you know what it's like when you're out camping, hopefully, maybe. Or you're out driving on the road and then there's lightning going across. And rolling thunder that kind of shakes your chest a little bit. Put all those things together. And then to be out in the tent. It's dark. It's cloudy. It's thunder. The earth shakes. I would be terrified as well. This is the power of God, and this is only like a small little sampling of it, because his power is something that it's really hard to fathom, just how big he is when we understand just how much he's made and created in our universe. This is the power of God, the glory of God manifest. But he didn't come there to destroy them. He came there to give them commands. He gave them direction on how to live and how to interact for their society, they had civil laws that they received from, from God there. They, they came for religious rules, how they were supposed to do church. And they finally, moral laws. The first two were just for Israel. The, the final was for Israel and also for all people, those moral laws summarized in the Ten Commandments. He gave all of that because he loved the people. He wasn't going to use this power to destroy. This is good news. And we saw that in our scripture reading earlier just how that glory of God was there on behalf of his people, that his presence, even though it's powerful, 
even though it can be destructive, is there on our behalf and for our good. This is a picture of that little tabernacle that they would build, and that was their center of worship. It was like a mobile temple that they could bring wherever they traveled to, and all the, all the tents of all the people in, by tribe would go out and fan out with that temple right in the middle. And that temple had the pillar of smoke during the day, and it turned into a pillar of fire by night, a miraculous re revelation of God being with his people. Again, God's presence, power, but not to destroy. Power and presence for safety and security. Now contrast those two images from the Old Testament, because this pops up again and again as you're looking through the Old Testament, with how Jesus, as God, appears to his people in Jerusalem. Hey, go get me a donkey. Get me a beast of burden that I can sit on and come into town. Like, like we're not talking a sports car here. We're not talking a fancy motorcycle, a Ducati. We're talking a hoopty. We're talking like some kind of crazy, a pinto maybe? A donkey. Actually, not even a donkey, a, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Go and get that into town, bring it back to me, and then I'm going to ride that on into town. A, 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 a colt, the foal of a donkey that had never been ridden on. Which also, that kind of is interesting. If you have never had an animal that hasn't been trained or ridden, that takes time to break them in. To put a blanket on them would make them angry, let alone put a blanket on them in a person. It says something about the peace and demeanor of our Lord. But he gave them a reason why he wanted to make his presence known, coming into town on a donkey. He said, because the Lord needs it. Like, we, we don't need to know all the details here. We just need to know that the Lord needs these donkeys, and he needs one of them to ride in on. <coughs> now, sometimes the Lord gives us some pretty crazy asks in the Bible that they go countercultural, and they sound kind of weird, but we don't, oftentimes don't have an opportunity or a reason to ask why. We just have to say, Lord, if you need it, we'll, we'll do it. We're going to do that. We're going to follow through, even if it doesn't make sense. But I want you to focus on that word, need. Doesn't that sound weird? Considering who's speaking? The Lord needs it. What does the Lord really need to, to sustain himself? Nothing. Nothing. The powerful God who dwelled on Mount Sinai, the God who showed up in a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke, the God who time and time again delivered his people. Did he need anything? He needs nothing. He is fine existing on his own. But here's the humble thing. He says, I need this from you. He has power, but he also has humility on behalf of his people to bring them in to the process of what he's doing, to bring them in to his work that he doesn't call powerful angels, or do things himself, he says, no, I want to get a, a lowly farmer kid from Keele, Wisconsin, to become a pastor. I, I want to get somebody in, in the neighborhood who's got a crazy past to all of a sudden come in and be my disciple. I want to get somebody who has spent some time away from me to now come in and follow me. I want somebody who's a teenager to lead services with PowerPoint and, and, and sound to control like all of this for us. I want the little children to come to me and to bring palm branches. The God of power also demonstrates his humility as he comes into town and he asks for help or he asks for supplies. That's our first point today. If you want to jot that down, there's a spot inside your worship handout to fill in the blank, worship handout to fill in the blank, or using that um, version Bible app under the events portion. Jesus is king in power and humility. Power and humility. Humbly coming down, entering in Jerusalem, riding that beast of burden, that donkey. And all the people were just excited by it because as a Jewish person, as you were growing up, when you were getting ready for your bar mitzvah, you would have studied the Old Testament, learned Hebrew, and been able to recite these things out loud, like 
this quote from Zechariah that says, Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This was written hundreds of years before Jesus. Those who had this memorized and hearing what Jesus had done and hearing what he had been saying and knowing that he was coming into town, they were ecstatic. Zechariah says, Re rejoice, you know. Say to daughters, shout out loud in the streets. Bring your palms, bring your branches. Present these things to the king who comes. And so when he was coming into town, this was big. Because this wasn't just a normal Monday. He was coming in on Palm Sunday, the week before the Passover meal. The week before they were going to have a big Jewish celebration where there was about maybe one, maybe even two million people in and around Jerusalem for this special celebration. So you got a lot of people to hear this message. You got a lot of people anticipating a Messiah. And now you got a lot of people thinking that this could be the final Messiah, the one we've been waiting for. But people in the crowd, they all had their different aspirations and reasons for being there. Right? I mean, you've got kids that were super excited and adults who were maybe people who he had healed who came with him from Galilee down to Jerusalem, people who had heard him speak. You also have people who heard from a friend, from a friend, from a friend, who were coming to see Jesus because they heard just maybe he's the Messiah who's going to kick the Romans out to bring us social order, to bring us our own independence. There's a lot of different people in the crowd, a lot of different people with different reasons for coming to Jesus. And then I think of our own our own reasons to come and talk to Jesus in prayer, our own reasons to come and listen to him on a Sunday morning, our own reasons that sometimes are pure and noble and good and sometimes, ugh. Honestly, I've had moments where you, where you come on Sunday morning because you have to. And, and you, you come because, you know, it's what's expected or because, well, this is what we've always done or because... Your, your mom had to kick you out of bed and take the curtain and just flick it up, you know, and sing songs to you and just yell at you. <laughs> We've had moments, right? Or coming to Jesus at times when everything else has kind of melted away and finally I am in a really hard place right now and I just financially it's not working or my job's not working or my marriage isn't working or my kids aren't working or my work's not working and I just need something. I've tried everything. Finally, I've got to talk to you, God. Maybe it'll help. There's all different reasons on any given Sunday, on any given day, we come to God in prayer. But the unique thing here is not the people coming to him. He said he comes to us. He's the one entering into the town. He's the one coming into the picture. It's not dependent upon everybody else getting it straight and getting it right and coming for the right reason. It's, it's that he comes to us right in the middle of our mess right where we are. And he says, here, I'm here. I'm your king. I'm in power and I'm in humility and I'm for you. The king comes to you. I've talked to people who think that they have to get their life straightened out before they can come to God, before they would ever step foot in a church, before they can even talk about religion. They've got to have their thing right. But friends, that's not how Jesus worked. He didn't come for the healthy came for the sick. He's a doctor of souls. He's our perfect Savior. That's why he came. He comes to us. He comes to you. He comes to me. So there's some peace there. I can't mess it up. I love it. That's where we have this very large crowd coming together, cutting the branches, things along the road. They put them down, and they were yelling out, that he was coming to them, they were excited. So they're yelling, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna. How's your Hebrew? Hosanna means? What's that? I think I heard it. Save us. Hosanna just means save us. They're just yelling out, save us, son of David. Save us in the highest heaven. Save us. We need help. I need you, God. I need you, God. I need you, God. Save us. Again, there were so many reasons why they'd yell out Hosanna. 
But ultimately, there is one reason he came. And that's the most important reason. Because underneath every other thing that happens in our life, there is a root of the problem of our sin. All of our sinful thoughts, our sinful words, and our sinful actions. Not pointing the finger at anything else or any other situation or any other person. Every one of us has that root of sin that Jesus is digging out. And every time we come in close, he digs a little deeper, and sometimes that hurts. And sometimes when our friends tell us that we did something wrong, we don't want to hear it, and maybe we even get defensive, but we need it. How do you heal it unless you bring it out and expose it? If, if, a, if a surgeon's working on somebody and they got a little gangrene working on there and there's an infection, they don't just get rid of the infection, they cut deep, deep, deep around the root of it, right? And Jesus gets to the heart of it. And he says, I know why you need to be saved. So the next point here, it's, there's a fill in the blank, but I think this would be a good time for just some contemplation for ourselves. My prayer is that Jesus saved me from... So take your, your a moment. We gave you pens, and if you lost it already, or if your kid took it apart and the spring is gone, it's understandable. Ask a mom. She's got a purse. There's something buried down there you can write with. My prayer is that Jesus save me from what? Now, I know you can put down maybe a health thing. Save me from this health thing that I got. Um, cancer is a popular one, right? Or uh, an issue with my leg or my toe. Certainly put those things and bring them to God. But maybe below that health thing, there's another thing that's a problem. Maybe even a sinful thing. Lord, I rely too much on my own strength. And even though my strength is failing, help me to cling more and more to you. Help me to become less and less dependent on myself, more and more dependent on you. That's a good prayer. What other things can you add to this? Writing down things that you would be saved from. Save me from what's happening in April. April 15th, is that the date? <laughs> Taxes. They extended it. Oh, they extended it. They're so gracious. <laughs> Save me from... Some of my financial issues, maybe. But then again, below the surface of that main issue, there might be other things. You know, save me from my discontentment. Save me from my, my missing and, 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 and thankless heart that, that is more inclined to look at what other people have instead of what I have been blessed with right now. Save me from. Save me from... That person at work. Save me from that family member. Save me from myself. Man, I am so hard on myself, and the things I say to myself are downright sinful when I tear myself down with the words and thoughts I have. Save me. Anybody? Well, let's give you a minute. That's a long time. Jogging your memory. What saving would you want to focus on? Take a moment, jot something down. I'm going to jot something down as well. Save me from. All right, this is more than just a shopping list or a, a, like a put-in-a-wish list. This is like, I'm bringing this to you, God. This is something that's an issue for me, personally. Save me. Hosanna, save me. 
Son of David, save me. And as you're, you're, you're saying these things to the Lord and you're praying these things to the Lord, you hear the people around you saying, who is this? Everybody's deeply stirred. Who is this that's asking me to be honest with him and to really look below the surface? Who is this? People in the crowd, some responding, some things, some another. At Jesus' time, they said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Some of them, they thought he was just a good speaker and a good um, teacher from Galilee. But you and I know a little bit more about him. We know he's the one that looks at our list, and he doesn't look and say, well, I'm not going to save you from that. How many times have you come to me with that? And he says, I know. And he says, I forgive you. And he says, I love you still. And he picks you back up. And he says, you're going to be okay. You're going to get through this, not by your own power, not by your own strength, but through me. Who is this? This is Jesus, our Savior. Then he turned a corner and he looked over that big city, Jerusalem, that was swelled with people. And after being presented with all this excitement and all this glory, he turns with a, and he sheds a tear. And he wept over Jerusalem and he said, if you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Jesus is a true man. He's also a true God. So when he looks over and he scans the horizon and all those tents and all those houses, he knows what's going on inside of each of them. And he knows what's going on inside of each of everybody's heart as well. And it makes him sad. Because sure, there was a big crowd that came out to greet him. Many of them were confused. And then many others still were lost. Because they were chasing things that were not God. They were trying to fill themselves with peace from things that just kept slipping through their fingertips. Because nothing quite satisfies like my Jesus. Now is our time to share the king, to share this king who gives true peace. To take that in for ourselves and then to bring it to other people. Because, you know, people are looking and they have questions. Who is this Jesus? What is this truth? Why do you have peace even though life is so chaotic? Well, I know Jesus, friend. Let me tell you more. Share Jesus where there's true peace. And it's almost Easter. I mentioned this last week. If you have somebody who doesn't watch football and yet there's a Super Bowl coming up, and there's food, and you invite them to come, they're going to come. Even if they're not fans, they're going to come because it's a Super Bowl. Next week, Super Bowl, kind of. The celebration of the resurrection. We're going to hear about our Savior once again in just a really easy, simple, digestible way. And then afterwards, hang out for food and for egg hunts. It's really cool, really easy. Here's some people you can invite. The center, that's your house. The, the house that's behind the yellow at the center, that's your, your neighbor behind you. And the neighbor in front of you and the neighbor to the side. You get the idea, right? I put that in, your, in the service folder that you can complete that yourself. If you don't know their name, non-threatening way, bring them a little gift. We've got these little egging bags. It's got some candy and an invite to Easter. Pretty simple. Hey, we're celebrating at our church next week. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you, you know, but we'd love to have you with us. I just wanted to get you to know you. We've been here however many years, but I don't quite know you yet. So come on over. Let's do this. It is doable. And people are most inclined to say yes this time of year. And then we can share this great thing that we have. Because when, when you come in, you're not going to be forced to sing. You're not going to be forced to talk to anybody. We won't invite anybody to come to the front and say anything. You can just relax and listen and be at peace. Something that is rare these days. To just be at peace. To calm those troubled thoughts. To not think about everything else.
but focusing on what God is and what he's done for us. We love that. And we want to share that with more and more people. Now as we close out, my encouragement is to do this. To actually do this. Because it is going to be so good when eventually we get to heaven and we hear the Father say to us, hey, you're going to want to go and talk to that person over there. They're here because you gave them a plastic Easter egg with a postcard invite. Thanks. Good work. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. All by the grace of God. Amen. We continue with the words of the Nicene Creed. Here's my clicker. It's malfunctioning. There we go. I invite you to please stand. As we confess our faith with the Nicene Creed, this is an ancient statement about what we, what we believe God's word says about him. So I invite you to follow along with this as we confess. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, and for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.